My name is Dick Wilkerson, and I'm the chair of the board of the South County Institute of Medicine and Public Health. I'm here this morning. I need to recognize somebody who should be standing here, and that's our president and CEO, Maya Pack, who unfortunately is, is ill and couldn't make it. So I'm subbing for her, and uh, we wish her well. The IMPH is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization working to collectively to inform and improve public policy on health and health care. I'm here today to present South Carolina's Guide to Approved Uses for Investing Opioid Settlement Funds, an important report that was commissioned by the South Carolina Department of Alcohol and Other Drug Abuse Services. That will serve as a, a resource for the county and municipal policyholders on appropriate opioid abatement strategies that can be funded by this settlement and future settlements. With me today, we're fortunate to have the director of DAODAS, Sarah Goldsby, Dr. Edward Simmer, the director of DHEC, Attorney General Alan Wilson, and of course our governor, the Honorable Henry McMaster. In February, the National Prescription Opiate Litigation Plaintiffs Executive Committee finalized settlements totaling $26 billion with the big three drug distributors, Amerisource Bergen, Cardinal Health, and McKesson, and opioid manufacturer Johnson & Johnson. 52 states and territories and thousands of local governments across the country signed on to the agreement. In addition to the national agreements, South Carolina Attorney General Wilson worked with South Carolina counties and eligible municipalities to allocate more than $360 million coming to South Carolina over the next 18 years. Through an agreement reached by Wilson and the litigating counties, 92% of these funds will be used to directly address the opioid crisis. The South Carolina Opioid Recovery Fund Board will be created to manage and disperse these funds. The board will be comprised of nine members who will be appointed and represent the four regions of our state. All money allocated to counties and eligible municipalities that has not been used in three years will be moved to the discretionary subfund from which any person or entity can request funding for approved abatement strategies. In response to the settlement, we are excited to release our newest report entitled South Carolina's Guide to Approved Uses for Investing Opioid Settlement Funds. Working in partnership with the South Carolina Department of Alcohol and Other Drug Abuse Services, IMPH convened a group of subject matter experts to develop this guide. The guide outlines the most effective abatement strategies. The report can serve as a resource for county and municipal policyholders, policymakers, their staffs, and other applicants navigating this and future settlements. The report will be updated periodically. I'd like to thank everyone that made this report possible. The authors, Director Sarah Goldsby and Jimmy Mount from DAS, and Hunter Sox from IMPH. Subject matter experts, Dr. Christina Andrew, Andrews, Dr. Kathleen Brady, Director Sarah Goldsby, Dr. Alan Litwin, and Dr. Edward Simmer. Contributors, R Roberta Brannick, Emily Kennedy, and Mitchell Nienheis, Nienheis, the Municipal Association of South Carolina, the South Carolina Association of Counties, certainly Attorney General Alan Wilson and his team, and of course, the Honorable Henry McMaster and his team. They've made a dramatic investment for us to have this report. And now I'd like to introduce and welcome DAO DAS Director Sarah Goldsby. As Director of South Carolina Department of Alcohol and Other Drug Abuse Services, Sarah Goldsby has led South Carolina's response to the opioid crisis and currently serves as co-chair of the State Opioid Emergency Response Team. Under her leadership, DAO DAS has been instrumental in implementing many prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery strategies. 
In 2019, Director Goldsby was recipient of the National Ramsed Kennedy Award in recognition of her leadership <coughs> and support of recovery programming. She currently serves as president of the National Association of State Alcohol and Drug Abuse Directors and is appointed to several national and federal substance uh, advisory committees. Director Goldsby. Thank you, and good morning. Uh, DEOTAS, or the Department of Alcohol and Other Drug Abuse Services, is the state's agency that oversees the publicly funded substance use system. Our role is to see to it that quality prevention programming, treatment, and recovery services are available to South Carolinians through our public and private partners statewide. And we were incredibly relieved when we learned that the National Prescription Opiate Litigation Agreements would require settlement funds to be used for strategies that are responsive to the needs of the folks who are still experiencing addiction, overdose, and other consequences related to the ever-evolving substance use crisis that America is experiencing. Because those strategies are so familiar to us and what we work on to support every day, we knew that DEOTAS had a responsibility to share more information and details about those strategies with decision makers overseeing the settlement dollars coming to our state, and also the many folks who will be doing the work to relieve the impact of the opioid crisis. We asked the South Carolina Institute of Medicine and Public Health to help us convene the top experts from our academic research institutions to lend guidance and knowledge of the tried and true strategies to a document that can be shared and used in a practical way as South Carolina expands programmatic infrastructure to prevent and address addiction. We were honored to bring together a team of exceptional subject matter experts to help create this guide. And I say it often, we are very lucky to have these nationally known topic experts here in South Carolina. Dr. Christina Andrews, Associate Professor of Health Services Policy and Management at the Arnold School of Public Health at the University of South Carolina, is known nationally for her research on financing and substance use disorder treatment access. She's currently the principal investigator on two research grants funded by the National Institutes of Health related to access to opioid use disorder treatment, and she's co-investigator on two national institutes of drug abuse funded projects related to insurance coverage of opioid use disorder treatment and access in the criminal justice settings. Dr. Kathleen Brady is the former vice president for research at the Medical University of South Carolina, and she's considered a national expert on substance use issues. She's currently the principal investigator of the Southern Consortium Node of the National Institute of Drug Abuse Clinical Trials Network and is the director of MUSC's Women's Research Center. She's the recipient of numerous awards and honors for her contributions to the field of addiction psychiatry. And while she's published hundreds of journal articles and edited many textbooks, she most recently edited the American Psychiatric Association's textbook of substance use disorder treatment. Dr. Alan Litwin of the Prisma Health Addiction Medicine Center is a professor at both the University of South Carolina School of Medicine in Greenville and Clemson University's Health Research, School of Health Research. Dr. Litwin is board certified in addiction medicine and internal medicine and has been providing substance use disorder and addiction medicine to people with opioid use disorders and complex social, psychiatric, and med medical needs within an integrated primary care and opioid agonist treatment program for 20 years. He has served on national and international advisory boards as an expert on the intersection of infectious disease and substance use. And since he came to South Carolina a few years ago, I believe he's single-handedly improved population health in the upstate. And finally, Dr. Edward Simmer, uh, Agency Director at the Department of Health and Environmental Control, whom I've had the pleasure of introducing to you in just a moment. Um, with the lives at stake, in this drug crisis, we really cannot afford to squander the settlement funds. And these experts have given content, depth, and detail based on the best science and the latest research to supplement the core strategies and approved uses of the funds outlined in the settlement agreement. All of the research shows that when evidence-based programs and services are implemented, we get the outcomes that we need. So I'm happy now to introduce Dr. Edward Simmer, our director at DHEC. He was appointed by DHEX board and assumed his duties as agency director this last February after being confirmed by South Carolina's Senate. And prior to being confirmed as agency director, Dr. Simmer served for over 30 years on active duty with the United States Navy. 
In his most recent assignment, he served as first chief medical officer and deputy director for TRICARE Health Plan the defense agency, uh, at the Defense Agency Health. And Dr. Simmer is also a distinguished fellow of the American Psychiatric Association, and he maintains an active clinical practice as a forensic and general psychiatrist. He has treated patients medically for their opioid use disorders, helping them on their path to recovery. Dr. Simmer, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Sarah, for that great introduction. Uh, I will try to live up to that. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for being here this morning. You know, when I look at this document and what it represents and the work that it has gone into it, the word I think of is hope. I think this document represents hope. Now, we know that opiate abuse, opiate overdoses and deaths are a public health crisis of the first order in South Carolina and across our nation. Let me just give you a couple very quick data points. In, in 2019, we had 876 South Carolinians die from an opiate overdose. And that sounds terrible. But then consider that in 2020, that jumped 59% to 1,400. And based on the preliminary data I've seen just this week, in 2021, that has now increased another 22% to 1,700. So that means just in the last three years, we've lost 4,000 South Carolinians to the abuse and overdose with opiates. And that is a terrible crisis. And of course, it's not just those 4,000 people, as important as they are, but they have family, friends, communities that are impacted as well. So this absolutely is something that we have to address and we have to address aggressively. And also consider that just in the past year, there were 681 opiate prescriptions written for 1,000 South Carolinians. That means on average, two thirds of the people in South Carolina got a prescription for opiates. Now we know in reality, of course, some got more than one, more than that got zero, but that tells you that there's an incredible amount of opiates coming into our state, and that's just the legal opiates. Think about all the illegal opiates, the fentanyl pills and things that the traffickers are bringing into our state. This is a major crisis, and that's why this is so important. So why am I hopeful with data like that? I'm hopeful because of the leadership we have. We have Governor McMaster who has said this is a top priority for our state. We have Attorney General Wilson who negotiated this settlement to get us the funds to help us combat this problem, and who every day he and his team are going after those traffickers to try to stop them and prevent even more drugs from coming into South Carolina. The amazing leadership of Director Goldsby, thank you for that, and her team, and the great work they do to ensure that treatment is available, that prevention services are out there, and that people are educated about this problem and how to address it. And of course, our own staff at DHAC, Emma Thompson, who's right there, and does a great job uh, leading our efforts on this. And of course, all the substance abuse providers statewide, who help treat patients with this problem, and all of our first responders, police officers, firefighters, EMS professionals, who are on the front line seeing this problem every day, and I can tell you we're out there saving lives every day from this crisis. I'm also hopeful because of the guidance in this document and the settlement funds that are gonna be put to this problem that will allow us to continue and expand the work that's already being done. And we are already taking action. We have the DOTIS and DHAC working together created the Law Enforcement Officers Narcan program, or LEON for short, which has trained over 275 agencies, 14,000 law enforcement officers who have saved over 3,000 lives by administering Narcan after an overdose. That led to the ROLL program, or the Reducing Opioid Loss of Life program for firefighters, which has now involved 189 fire departments, trained over 3,600 firefighters, and they've saved an additional over 1,000 lives. So we are making progress, but we know much more needs to be done, and that's why this is so important. We have the distinguished experts that you've heard at Theotis, at IMPH, and elsewhere that are working on this problem, and they have helped develop this document, and of course now we have funding to support the work in this document. And let me tell you just very briefly some of what's in there. This document includes expanded access to things like Narcan to, to save people who are in the midst of an overdose and other things that can help reverse the effects of withdrawal of uh, overdoses and save lives in South Carolina every day. We have treatment recommendations to provide comprehensive treatment to people suffering opiate addiction. It's an incredibly difficult disease to treat, an incredibly difficult disease to beat if you have it, but people can and do get better. There is hope. And it's very important that we remember that. That includes medications like bupropion and methadone. I'm sorry, 
buprenorphine in methadone, but also things like warm handoffs. So if you come to an emergency room and you're in the midst of an overdose, after they treat you, they don't just send you home. They have somewhere where they can actually put you on the phone with a treatment provider and set up your first appointment before you ever leave. That makes a big difference in outcomes. Using things like fentanyl strips so that when a college student buys what he thinks is an Adderall pill to help him stay awake at night, bad idea as that is, right, at least he can test it to see if there's fentanyl in there that's going to kill him. Right? And that kind of thing saves lives. Also, of course, there's a lot in here on prevention, on training and education, and very importantly on collecting data on how we're doing. So we know which of these programs are working and we should grow them. And which of these programs maybe aren't working so well and we need to change them or discontinue them. A very important part of any effective program and that's in here. So, and I can tell you with DHEC, we're already using this report and putting it to action. Over the next couple of months, we will make fentanyl test strips available through our health departments at no charge. We will make Narcan available to the public and training in how to use it so that people have the tools they need to help combat this crisis. So, while this document and the funding will help, we know that there are still challenges to be overcome. This is not an easy problem to solve, and we have a lot of work to do. No one person or entity can solve this problem by themselves, but that's why I have hope, because by working together with all the people standing here with me, by all the people out here, and with the people of South Carolina, we can succeed and we will succeed. So today I am hopeful, because I'm convinced we will save lives, we'll take back control of our state from the opiates, and we will make a South Carolina a better place for all. Thank you. And I'll turn it back over to Director Goldsby. Dr. Simmer, thank you for your leadership and your partnership and reminding us that there is hope. It's my pleasure now to introduce Attorney General Alan Wilson. He was elected South Carolina's 51st Attorney General in 2010 and is currently in his third stint in office. Previously, he served under former Attorneys General Car Charlie Condon and Henry McMaster. And he and his team have poured years of hard work into litigation against the pharmaceutical manufacturers, leading with many other attorneys general and local governments to arrive at a settlement agreement making the much needed relief resources for our nation and for our state possible. None of the resources and efforts ahead would be possible without that success. Thank you all. Good morning. I'd like to start by thanking the South Carolina Institute of Medicine and Public Health and the South Carolina Department of Alcohol and Other Drug Abuse Services for inviting me to speak here today. I am a, it is an honor to be joined by Governor McMaster, Director Goldsby, and Dr. Simmer, all of whom have made uh, combating the opioid epidemic a top priority for their agencies and for this administration, so thank you all. For the past half decade, my office has investigated and litigated against several companies that contributed to South Carolina's opioid crisis. I have tasked our Consumer Protection Division with ensuring we make every effort to obtain resources to help our state using the tools in our legal arsenal. We have been joined in this fight by other attorneys general from around the country, and through our collective efforts, we've had significant success. In February of 2021, we joined a $573 million settlement with McKinsey & Company, a consulting firm that worked with Purdue and others to unlawfully promote opioids and profit from this epidemic. South Carolina is receiving just under $9 million from that settlement. My office has also been involved with cases against two opioid manufacturers, Purdue and Mallinckrodt. Both companies filed, uh, filed for bankruptcy, but we are working closely with others nationally to ensure that resources will be available for opioid abatement. Finally, and most prominently, last fall I announced South Carolina's participation in a historic $26 billion settlement with three major pharmaceutical distributors, Cardinal, McKesson, and Amerisource Bergen, as well as one opioid manufacturer, Johnson & Johnson. This settlement will have direct, tangible benefits for all of South Carolina. The distributors that I just mentioned will be required to report information about their opioid deliveries to one central place, which will help identify overshipments and suspicious orders from the pharmacies. The distributors will also block shipments if there are signs of diversion. Johnson & Johnson will be exiting the opioid market as a result of this settlement, 
and they will also be banned from funding any opioid promotion efforts or lobbying on opioid-related activities. Following the, the announcement of the national settlement, we worked closely with stakeholders throughout the state on how best to implement this settlement for South Carolina. We engaged in discussions with all of our litigating counties and cities and put together a plan where more than 92% of the funds will be used for opioid abatement. And because we were able to secure 100% um, participation from all 46 of South Carolina's counties and our 43 eligible cities, and eligible cities means people, cities with more than 10,000 um, person population, more than $330 million will be available for opioid abatement projects throughout the state. This money will be coming to the state over the next 18 years, so it's not a one-time lump. It's going to be over 18 years for that $330 million. However, thanks to our state passing a legislative bar on certain claims, Johnson & Johnson will be paying its next four years of payments this year. By the end of 2022, South Carolina will have already received more than $75 million from distributors and Johnson & Johnson. About two-thirds of that money is set aside for use by the counties and eligible cities, while the rest is discretionary funding that anyone can apply for, including hospitals, nonprofits, state agencies, and others. The money available to the counties and cities has been divided pers uh, pursuant to an agreed-upon formula that uh, utilizes opioid harm metrics. It is my hope, as additional settlements are reached, and bankruptcy plans are approved that this fund will continue to grow and have an even greater impact on combating the opioid issue in our state. Just about a month ago, Governor McMaster signed into law the South Carolina Opioid Recovery Act. Thank you. Uh, this law creates a dedicated fund for opioid settlement money and a board of nine opioid and public health experts who will evaluate and approve requests for this money. The board is currently being assembled and will have its first meeting sometime next month. My office is working closely with the State Fiscal Accountability Authority on making sure the board has everything it needs to hit the ground running. It is my hope that we'll be able to start putting this money to use in just a few months. I'm designating one of our consumer protection attorneys to serve as a legal advisor to the board to ensure that we are complying with all the laws settlement agreements and court orders including a list of approved opioid abatement strategies that form the basis for this new guide and uh, this new guide right here couldn't have been made possible uh, and as well as the settlement if it wasn't for the support of the staff and the consumer protection uh, division of the attorney general's office and i would like to have them raise their hands if you're with the attorney general's office and you worked on this opio uh, the opioid settlement agreement please raise your hand so over here The head of our Consumer Protection and Antitrust Division is Sonny Jones. We also have uh, Jared Libet, Anna Smith, and Rebecca Hartner. Um, Jared Libet, who has actually asked him to stand up here. Jared, raise your hand. He will be the advisor to this nine-member board. There is no one in this state that knows more about this opioid settlement agreement and the rules and laws applied to it than Jared Libet. And he lives, uh, breathes, and drinks this stuff. And so he will be, he will be uh, serving... Um, uh, as an advisor to the board that will be appointed here shortly. Um, I am very thankful to everyone who contributed to the guide that I just held up. I know it will be a monumental assistance to the board as they undertake their mission and carry out this vitally important work. So thank you to all of you up here with me today, all of you out there who are doing the Lord's work, and obviously to our, our staff at the Attorney General's office. Thank you. It's a true privilege to serve under his leadership, and it's my honor now to introduce our Governor, Henry McMaster. In the many roles that he has had serving our nation and our state, we always see him prioritizing the population's health and the well-being of families and individuals, especially those who are most vulnerable. In his time as governor, he has led Team South Carolina with the expectation that we collaborate and coordinate essential elements for success in any endeavor, but certainly essential to our collective progress on the opioid issues in South Carolina. He guides us to think big and act boldly. Ladies and gentlemen, Governor McMaster. Thank you, Thank you, Sarah. 
Thank you. Thank you. Y'all, thank, thank you for coming. Uh, South Carolina's got talent. We know that, and as you heard a few moments ago, the people that are, have worked on this have enormous talent, and a lot of our people in the state don't realize how much talent and expertise we have in our state that's available for these kind of challenges and other guidance as well. So I want to thank all of them. I particularly want to thank Sarah Goldsby for alerting all of us to this dynamic, horrendous assault on our people some years ago. And I want to thank the senators and representatives here for recognizing and responding quickly, and the Attorney General for the fantastic legal work that he's done and the thought that's gone into this. But we have, a, have talent, but we also have a team. And you're looking at some of it now. And they're not only here, but, but out, out there. And others who are not here with us today. Uh, but the reason that we are doing this is because South Carolina has talent. And we want, we've got great people. All of the business leaders that I speak to from around the world tell me that over and over about how great our people are loyal, they're dependable, uh, they're patriots, they think right, they do right, and it is our job to be sure that all of those people, all of whom have talent of some kind, are able to rise and be a part of this great prosperity that our state is enjoying now, and which is just the beginning of what is coming in the future if we do things right now for our people. So this is a great step forward, and again, I commend all of those involved, not only in their expertise and experience which took, and insight which took years to acquire, but also their willingness to work together to communicate, collaborate, and cooperate for the future of our great people of our great state. So thank you. Let me just uh, thank the, uh, the presenters here. I, I think the, the level of importance of the problem in the report is reflected by the, the spectacular level of people we have presenting today. We have two department heads, the attorney general and the governor of our state, talking about a problem that affects us all. The report that's been prepared is going to be distributed statewide to municipality leaders, to legislators, to business leaders. If you haven't gotten a copy, they're available as you came in. You can get them on the way out. Um, I'm going to ask Sarah Goldsby to come up again to handle questions. I'm not going to say her organization. If she had told me ahead of time, I could see Dio da, Deo Das or Doi Das. It, it would have been a lot easier than trying to say D-A-O-D-A-S four times in my presentation. But Sarah, please come up and handle the questions. And, and I really do need to recognize our legislators who are up here with us today um, have contributed so much to the policy that makes the work inside this document even possible. Um, and thank you so much for your hard work because without those policy levers, so much of the work that we're trying to accomplish would not be achievable. And so now uh, we will take brief questions from the media that are on topic. ask Jared Libet, who knows everything, <laughs> to, to come up and answer them. So we anticipate the board will have its first meeting next month, as was required by the, the Opioid Recovery Act that was recently signed. At that first meeting, the board will be approving its bylaws and its application process. Once that's done, we'll roll that out statewide and ask folks to start submitting in applications for funds, both for the political subdivisions, the cities and the counties, and any other hospitals, nonprofits, whoever, that would like to get some of the discretionary money. And anticipated this fall, when they come back for the next meeting, they'll start going through the first requests and, and giving them the thumbs up. I 
beg your pardon. Could you please repeat the question? Yes, and I think um, a lot of the focus has been on fast tracking individuals who touch a hospital into treatment. And so we've got several programs around the state at some of our top hospitals who have been very successful over the last few years in getting folks fast tracked to treatment. We need that work to expand. And I think the resources that we have here is going to help that work grow, spread, and scale. And I we have to cut off the question.